Welcome to another Motor Authority Hangout. Today, I'm joined by Marty Padgett, Editorial Director of High Gear Media, and Nelson Ireson, Editor of Motor Authority, and me, Joel Fetter, Social Media Manager of High Gear Media. Gentlemen? Gentlemen? Oh, I thought somebody... Oh, sorry, sorry. Guys? <laughs> How are you? Good. Um, introduce yourselves. Marty, here you go. Uh, I am Marty Paget, and I am just back from Spain from driving the new two, 2014 E-Class, including the 2015 E400, and also getting pulled over by the Spanish police. And amazingly, they let him go. Who knows why? Uh, all right, and then we have Nelson. Nelson, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm just back from driving the new 2013 SLS AMG GT out at the streets of Willow in California. I also got a chance to drive the entire AMG lineup, although it was all compressed into a half day, so, you know, it, it was a sampling. All right, so, now that we've introduced ourselves, why don't we uh, just jump right into the topics. Uh, Marty, like you said, you just got back from Spain, almost getting arrested, driving the new E63 AMG. Not arrested. We were almost detained. arrested. We were, um, we were, uh, why don't you tell us a little about that car, and it has all the driving and everything. Tell us about some of the changes. Okay, so the E-Class for 2014, basically there are a lot of cosmetic changes. Uh, they've taken away a lot of the, for lack of a better word, a lot of the wrinkles from the front end. You know, the last generation E-Class had a lot of creases baked into the front end that were supposed to make it look more masculine. It, it ended up making it look a little bit too edgy. So they've smoothed that out and you can see here on the screen that it ends up being a lot friendlier face. Um, and to me, the, the air intakes they've they formed into the lower far, lower part of the front end are a lot more Porsche-like. Um, I think that's pretty intentional, just to give it a more masculine edge. Uh, Mercedes PR people tell us that their dealers and their customers are asking for more and more sporty cars. Um, sport versions of the E-Class and of the C-Class are up to about 80 or 90 percent of their orders. So in general, the sportier the car looks, the better it's going to sell. The E-Class is headed in that direction. Some of the other changes that have come this year, they're downsizing the, four, the six cylinder turbo diesel to a four cylinder, has almost about the same amount of power and torque. Um, acceleration is going to be a little bit slower, but fuel economy could be well over 30 miles per gallon highway. They also let us drive the 2015 E Class with a twin turbo six cylinder that's eventually going to replace the eight cylinder in the sedan body style. And beyond that, we also drove the E Class. E63 AMGs, the sedans and the wagons. This year they get a power bump and they get a new S designation for the most powerful version. And they also get standard all-wheel drive in the U.S. So you want to tell us a little about your uh, almost getting caught by the cops or we can skip over that today? No, no, we can talk about it. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. I think I've been doing this for 22 years now and I have never been asked once for an international driver's license. And I think that the local police, who once they saw three or four Mercedes go by, uh, they realized there was a pattern going on. They didn't know what to make of it, so they pulled over everyone in an E-Class. Uh, after they sifted through the group and found those that didn't have international driver's licenses, uh, we were held aside for a while until they figured out what exactly the legality of the situation was. And in reality, uh, you're supposed to be able to drive in Europe, in Western Europe, in the EU at least, on your US driver's license but from now on apparently we're just all going to carry the international licenses for I don't know to give AAA 15 bucks for free yeah just to make things go more smoothly didn't get in the way of driving the cars though actually we had just had a brilliant run up this uh, mountain called Montserrat which as far as I knew was a volcano in the Caribbean that exploded a few years ago uh, but it's this beautiful series of mountains that has great canyon roads looping up and down the mountainside. It kind of reminded me of the best canyon roads that go up and up and down from Malibu. So we had a great time before that, flogging the E63. And the day before that, we had been driving around in the diesels and the uh, new twin turbo six cylinders. Some really worthwhile improvements to the E-Class. Good stuff. Uh, moving along, why don't we talk a little about the new 2013 Mercedes-Benz SLS AMG GT. Nelson, you just got back from driving that. Why don't you tell us a little about the changes and uh, driving of that vehicle? All right, yeah. I mean, the changes for 2013, it, it, get, it gets a new name. They stick GT on the end of it, uh, and they, they keep wanting to call it all new. But really, it's just a very light revamp 
of an already very good car. Uh, still a Roadster, still available as a Goldwing Coupe, but it gains 12 horsepower, it gets retuned AMG adaptive suspension, it gets a slightly retuned 7-speed dual clutch gearbox, um, and some minor aesthetic tweaks uh, inside, mostly. The, the red seat belts are really cool. Uh, I mean, if you're going to buy an SLS, why not get the red seat belts, right? Uh, but the point being, it doesn't really need much in the way of tweaks. Uh, it, it's just really very fun to drive, um, as you'll see in that video there, where I narrate a lap around the streets of Willow. Uh, just a really enjoyable car. Uh, at 200 grand, though, I don't know if that's the first place my 200 grand goes. Uh, but hey, you know, to each their own, I suppose. Wasn't that you driving with the gull wings open? <laughs> yeah, I wish. No, that was Tommy Kendall, a uh, four time Trans Am champ, AMG brand ambassador. He's also coming back out of retirement to actually race the new Viper GTSR at Le Mans this year. So he's an active racer despite having, you know, earned most of his fame 20 years ago. So that's, that's funny to me that he would know how to drive a SLS that well and get into the, let's say, similar Viper and be able to do the same. I, I, I know this might have, I think this was your first time driving an SLS. The first time you got in it, did you not look around and think, hmm, Viper? Actually, it wasn't my first time. first time was oh, it, that's right. you went to Mexico. nine. Yeah, in Mexico, uh, which we had another uh, run-in actually with some policemen there, um, although that was a much friendlier situation. They were actually escorting us through the country at, shall we just say, uh, very high speeds. It was good fun. speeds. Yeah, very, very good speeds. Um, so, yeah, not my first exposure, but yes, it, it behaves a lot like the Viper. Although, having driven both of the newest models of each, I, I definitely picked the Viper for the track car. Uh, I mean, A, it just gets much larger, much wider, much stickier tires, uh, but B, it's even more powerful. I mean, the SLS AMG GT is no slouch at 583 horsepower, but the Viper is 640, and that, you know, just absolutely bonkers V10 engine. Um, yeah as well as a really well-tuned chassis. Uh, the, the whole package just comes together on track, not to get too far off track from the GT. The GT costs about twice as much, and it's about three times as much car on the inside. So as a value proposition, you know, it's, not, it's a, lot, a lot better buy um, in that regard. It's got those Ferrari seats, though. Huh? The Vipers got the Ferrari seats now, and oh. I don't know, the first time they opened the doors on that, and I smelled the, Ferrari, the uh, Viper cockpit, I thought, all right, this this thing smells completely different. Actually, it, you know, it's it, it's the best smelling Chrysler ever. I don't know if there's ever been one that's actually smelled like something I would remember. But <laughs> the Italian, yeah, well, um, at, at least car. at least it doesn't smell like malt liquor and welding slag. <laughs> um, I was going to say all the yes essentials fabric in the world can't eliminate some of the smells you would normally hit in like a Wrangler, you know, especially after a weekend in Panama City. But <laughs> uh, that kind of a target demographic there. Um, so I was curious, what did they have to do to actually get the SLS to, to uh, hit the skid pad like that with the gull wings open? Is there some kind of an override mode? Because as far as no. We, no? We, actually, we actually found out uh, part of this in, in that Mexico trip three years ago, or four now, quite a while ago. Anyway, the car will drive with its doors open. It, it chimes at you quite a lot, but it will drive with the stores open. So all they had to do was flip the gull wings up and hit the gas. That sounds um, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Wing donuts. And yeah, was... uh, if you'll notice in the video, the, the outside door keeps drooping down, drooping down yeah. due to centrif or centripetal forces. There you go. Yeah, I remember that. It, it just seems like something there were maybe – Maybe we should go back and drop in a line. Kids don't try this at home, but you know, what kid is going to have a two hundred thousand dollar gull wing? Yeah, I mean, if you've got your you own private skin pack, coffee. <laughs> unless, oh. Yeah, unless the right kid will have one. Trust me. Yeah, and he'll probably have access to his own private skid pad. In which case, I say, hey, go ahead and do it. Just set up a camera for Yeah, us. just move your Gulfstream Five over a little bit. Also, send us the link to the YouTube video first, please. Yeah, or to the crazy Russian guy who comes up with the crash videos every morning. Ah, <laughs> chef, dude. Out to chef dude. <laughs> it was early right. to do that. Had to get you that might up. be a little off topic, but uh, 
let's uh, move along a little to the new Mercedes CLA, which was revealed in Detroit. Uh, Marty, you did the video of that. Obviously, all three of us saw it. Why don't you talk a little about that because you wrote the preview. Uh, yeah, the CLA. It's the first front driver that they've ever sold in the U.S. So um, I think they have neatly jumped over any questions of what a, what a $30,000 front drive Mercedes would be by putting Kate Upton on the television. And who knew it was that easy? I mean, just, hey, here's Kate Upton. Oh, by the way, we have a car, too. Very clever. Uh, I think they're going to sell every one of them that they can because it, they kind of have a couple things working in their favor. Number one, people have always wanted an inexpensive Mercedes to get into relative to the rest of the line. Um, you know, full disclosure, I worked there a long time ago for a year, and we always kind of saw that $30,000 price point as a magic barrier, even back then. So having a car at that price point helps introduce the brand to a whole set of buyers, never mind if they know who Kate Upton is or not. The other part of it is, it's, it's a buyer that is really influenced by lease prices and having something that inexpensive is going to be, let them get those cars into a whole new demographic that they need to keep bringing into the brand. You, know, you, can't, you can't have a, a car lineup that only appeals to people who are 50 years and older. And, you know, at a certain price, that's what you're going to do. The best thing of all is this car looks great. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say from pictures how good it looks, but if you've seen a CLS in person and you liked it, you'll really like this. It, it really takes all of those themes and packs it into a smaller package. It shouldn't work better, but in a lot of ways, I think it does. Of course, we don't know how it drives yet, but I'm actually going in two weeks to drive it. We'll find out then. Nice. I'm actually curious about the uh, CLA because, like you said, that $30,000 price point is important. Uh, BMW recently announced a car to try and hit that same price point. Now, BMW has some front-wheel drive cars in the works, in theory. Um, yeah. Perhaps in reality, we'll see, uh, at least for the U.S. But they recently unveiled or announced the 320i. Uh, same engine, stripped-down equipment, but a much lower price point, just, just a shade over thirty grand. And I wonder if people are going to go for that buy over, say, a CLA, uh, despite you know a less sexy image, because the three series spans upward into the sort of fifty thousand dollar range, so yeah. you can get into the same sort of thing for CLA money. I, so a couple of things. I, I think number one, BMW had to do something just to preserve a spot until they actually have a front a front drive car in that series to begin with, because they may actually be the last to arrive out of the three German makes. You know, Mercedes is here in the fall. Audis is supposed to be on the way for early next year. BMW might not be until the end of next year, even the beginning of 2015. So number one is timing, and you're taking away from three series profits to do that, but you kind of have to do it in the U.S. Um, but the other thing is, yeah, you are offering something that might be seen as more premium, but... I really wonder if that's the case where you're already getting people who are leasing a three series for three forty nine or three ninety nine a month if if the designation between rear drive and front drive is going to make the difference to those buyers uh, you're going to get a few enthusiasts who are going to realize the scream and bargain that they're getting in getting what is really a three thirty five i with you know go flash the chip at some friendly dealer and you have a three thirty five i minus some of the equipment um, yeah, but if that's three twenty eight i at any rate. 328i, sorry. Um, yeah. But that is a really small subset of the people who end up buying those least expensive versions. And let me tell you, there's not a CLS that's going to hit any, or a CLA that's going to hit a U.S. dealer that's going to go out the door for $30,000. Oh, yeah, no, there'll be tons of market. Now, 35, 36 is going to be the average transaction price, but uh, that's got to be six or $7,000 lower than what they're dealing with now with C Class. So it, it helps both of them in that it's bringing people back into German car brands where they might have felt shut out, um, but the timing is definitely in Mercedes's corner right now. So, go going on that, uh, let's move along to talking very quickly about the downsizing of the future of Mercedes. LEDs, twin turbos, four cylinders, six cylinders, eight cylinders. What are you guys seeing happening now? What's going to happen in the future? We touched on that a little earlier, but let's wrap up with that topic. Well, Nelson's point was a fair one about BMW, you know, downsizing the numbers, at least, on the car. So um, everybody's faced with downsizing, and we're at the point where you've got to make the numbers work for CAFE. 
So some companies are rebranding whole car lineups just to cover, and not cover up the fact, but to ameliorate the effect with the buyers. Infinity is changing all of their names because they're going to be going from V8s to 6s and from 6s to 4s. Um, and Mercedes sees this, uh, the diesel at least, going from a 6 to a 4 as a competitive advantage. They're going to spend less on building the diesel 4, get almost as much power, and they'll be able to price it better than some of the competition. Um, you know, if you can put a competitive product together with less displacement, you win. If you can't, then you're just downsizing. Right. And really, the, this move towards downsizing isn't, it's not new to Mercedes. They're already halfway through it, right? I mean, they brought out the 4.6 liter twin turbo. You know, they're, they're moving in that direction already. I mean, the, the 250, right? It's a 1.8 sure. liter turbo. Oh. For sure. So all we're seeing is phase two, sort of, of this realignment. Right. And it, it really gets interesting when you get into the big volume cars, which E-Class, when it drops the eight, the 8 for the 6, it'll be interesting to see if, the, if they will go ahead and adopt a bigger turbo 4 to take some of the volume out of their 6-cylinder cars. At the same time, they'll be coming out with a C-Class in the U.S. It's going to be a bigger car, but it's going to be able to get by without some of the bigger displacement engines. So at that point, is the C-Class all 4-cylinder and the AMG versions are twin turbo 6s? Don't know yet. It's a little too far off to, to know what that looks like, but those cars are in the pipeline. They're going to start being produced at the end of next year. Well, and speaking of AMG downsizing, the CLA for the A45 AMG, right? Yeah. Two, two liters and 360 horsepower. Yep. That, that, who can argue with that? I mean, from from wherever you're coming from, that's a great a great bargain. And and that's the same powertrain really that we're getting in the CLA45 that we'll see in the next couple of months. And all of the AMG compact vehicles are all going to be in that range for the U.S. So we're all going to have all-wheel drive. So those are you know those are things that you might have to get used to with AMG and with Mercedes if you're a longtime buyer. All-wheel drive AMGs and turbocharged small displacement engines versus you know that that gorgeous 6.2 liter naturally aspirated V8. But it's happened to everybody. So can you live with it? Get behind the wheel of one. I, I think. Well, there's also the fact that along with fuel economy, it's also saving weight over the front axle or wherever the engine is mounted. So you have less weight that's being thrown around for handling-wise. The whole right. cascade effect. Yeah, it, and it all makes sense as long as you can deliver performance and refinement. I think actually where everybody's fallen a little bit shy is refinement. And some companies do it better than others. You know, I, I think the twin turbo six in the E-Class works really well. I've been in some other products from some other automakers where downsizing hasn't really held up its part of the bargain in terms of refinement. All right. Well, we've covered the two main topics we have today, which are obviously downsizing and the new products from Mercedes-Benz. Um, any final thoughts from you guys as far as what you guys see coming from? The, I mean, we obviously know new S-Class is coming, the CLA AMG will come. Obviously, the E-Class is about to launch. What do you guys see maybe New York, and coming from New York Auto Show and L.A. Show in the fall? And uh, we'll wrap it up with that. Go ahead, Nelson. Well, you know, I don't know exactly what we're going to see. Mercedes has already released a lot of really new products over the past year. Uh, the one I'm seriously looking forward to the most, though, is the CLA 45 AMG. I mean, the price point, the performance point, the style point that that car is going to hit is going to be magical. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure where in the market you'd find a better alternative if it comes in, you know, $45,000, $50,000. That's going to be a very difficult car to beat uh, in, in any brand. I mean, period. That's, it's going to be really interesting to drive. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that's probably a year from where we are now. And between now and then, you get an S class, and we've been pretty uh, forthcoming about you know all the safety equipment that's being added to the E class this year. You know, there, there's actually a system that will sense an oncoming car and steer you gently away from it between say 35 and 120 miles an hour. That's a, a system that's going to be used on the new S class. You know, the, the new S class is going to spawn six different models, so We'll probably see the sedan first, but you know that could be a full year of marching out different variants of that. So I think this year for 
for Mercedes, it's there are a lot of carryover models, a lot of refreshes, but the big news is CLA and S class and these other things we've talked about, you know, the continual progress of downsizing and increasing performance and you know, I think the turbo diesel is big news for those people too. Um, because it's going to probably, if I was going to bet on it, I'd say it's going to mean 35 miles per gallon highway. In which car? I would say in the E-Class. If, if we're at 30 right now for the E with the current turbo diesel. Which is a 6. I think it could be pushing close to 35. Well... <laughs> We've covered all our topics, kept it under 20 minutes. For those of you who may be watching while you're at work, shame on you. No, we appreciate it. Um, oh, this, we love that. Thank you. Yes, very appreciative. Uh, depending on when you're watching this, we appreciate it. And um, gentlemen, thanks for joining me. We'll do this again soon. Good talk. <laughs> Good talk, John. Good talk. Have a great Good day, talk. guys.